thanks for joining us. I'm Catherine Hendy, one of the founders of Alanza Wellness, and I'm really delighted to be joined today by Dr. Lauren Berman. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Likewise. But Dr. Berman, just want to start by saying, you know, emotional support around fertility must actually be a really tough area to work in sometimes. What is it that you like about this field and working with fertility patients in particular? Well, I actually started my career working with mind-body. So my dissertation way, way back a million years ago was about the impact of stress on physical health. So that I did in the late 80s. And so you can see that like I had this whole mind-body um, uh, perspective that was in my mind. And then I also started working with uh, trauma cases, particularly sexual trauma, um, people who grew up in very dysfunctional families. And that I started working at the beginning of my career. And then when I hit upon fertility treatment, the two arenas merged. And so because there is a lot of mind body in fertility treatment, it's health psychology and um, and then it's also there's 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 some component of reproductive trauma or trauma treatment that goes into this work, um, but it's it's been very it's been my honor and privilege to work with people who are going through this journey. So you mentioned trauma there. Is that something you find that people might commonly be experiencing, or what are some of the, the areas that you help people with most frequently? So I have worked a lot with folks who have stillbirths or um, multiple miscarriages, and that can be very traumatizing, um, just to loss after loss after loss, or just to have this great hope and then lose the baby. So I do a lot of work with people who have had those kinds of experiences. Um, and then I also, just sometimes just the idea of losing, uh, uh, of an IVF not working mm -hmm. is a loss. There's a beautiful quote, can I read it to you, by Laura Bush? Please do, yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I mean, she, I didn't know she was such an amazing writer, but here's what she said. The English language lacks the words to mourn an absence. For the loss of a parent, grandparent, spouse, child, or friend, we have all manner of words and phrases, some helpful, some not. Still, we are conditioned to say something, even if it's only, I'm sorry for your loss. But for an absence, for someone who is never there at all, we are wordless to capture that particular emptiness. For those who deeply want children and are denied them, those missing babies hover like silent ephemeral shadows over their lives. Who can describe the feel of a tiny hand that is never held? So it gives me goosebumps when I read that. It's yeah. so profound and it really touches on the sense of loss that many patients feel. It seems to be that you're kind of saying that this is a grief, but it's a different kind of grief. The grief has a different texture. Spot on. I mean, that's exactly the case. Exactly the case. What sort of things can you help people with in that case? Are, you know, what might, might a typical appointment look like? Would it be talking therapies or are there other tools that you can use? So there's a lot of talking therapies. There's a lot of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown by research to be very helpful. Just giving people tools to be able to deal, cope with the the losses, cope with the anxiety, cope with the depression that accompanies fertility treatment. Uh, those tools are really, really helpful. Um, I work with, uh, I, I think you know that I work with EMDR, which is a trauma treatment to help people process those horrible experiences of loss. Do you mind explaining a bit more about EMDR, what, what that stands for and what it involves? Okay, that's, that takes a while. Let me see if I can do it in a short period of time. But EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And I'll give you a metaphor, or maybe it's not a metaphor, but um, 
yeah, this is a metaphor. So on my desk, I'm not going to show you what my desk looks like because during COVID, I have not um, kept my desk as spotless as when patients actually come into my office because we're doing a lot of telehealth now. But on my desk are a lot of papers. And when I am, what I'm going to do when I have some time is I'm going to go through the papers and I'm going to read them and figure out what I need to do with them. I'm going to process them. And then I have to my left, I have two tall file cabinets. I'm going to put them in the file cabinet. And when I put them in the file cabinet, they're not going to be in my face. They're not going to be a, they're not going to be agitating me. They're not going to be reminding me that they're there, but they'll be in the file cabinet. And if I need them, something will say, oh, I need to go find that and I'll go find that. So the papers on my desk are like traumatic memories. Traumatic memories are often very active and they stay very present in, um, sense, in a sensory way, in a cognitive way. They may affect your body. And so if we can process those memories and put them in the file cabinet, then they're there. They're never going to disappear, but they're not activating you. They're not aggravating you. And that's what EMDR does. And we, we, we accomplish that mostly through eye movement and certain protocols. I don't know. Did, I, did that explain it, Catherine? Yeah. So it's, it would be a kind of session where you would talk to somebody whilst they're doing sort of eye movements. And, and is there evidence, sort of published evidence, showing that that's effective? There's actually a significant amount of published evidence um, and it was originally pioneered on Vietnam veterans. Um, and they have been publishing on this for maybe 25 years. So there's some good evidence. The Veterans Administration, which is a federal agency here in the US, actually has approved it for treatment for veterans. So it's a really nice treatment. And I'm actually pretty scientific for a psychologist. So I'm not, I, uh, I tend to do a little research before I would adopt something. It's interesting to know because I think some people can be wary of the idea of a purely talking therapy if it's someone that's not necessarily comfortable or is expressing themselves. So it's nice to know that there's other tools in that toolbox. While we're on the topic of evidence, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the rates of mental and emotional struggles while people are facing um, fertility treatment or any battle with their fertility. Is it quite common? It's very common. And I was just reviewing an article, but I did not take down the specific statistics, but the rates of anxiety and depression are very, very high in fertility patients. It is such a stressful process and it taps down into the most primal part of us that yearning to build a family and so when it doesn't work or when there's obstacles or snags it it just grabs a hold accessing really good support why is that kind of potentially a better thing to do than talking to friends or family well a lot of my patients say to me that their friends and family don't get them they don't get fertility and they say insensitive things. Um, they say things like just relax and it will happen. They say things like um, maybe it's not God's will that you should get pregnant. Um, and they're, they're meaning well, but it's, it, it actually hits um, patients where it hurts the most. So part of it is that they don't want to expose themselves in, in a way to that kind, those kind of insensitive comments, because those, those relationships are very important for support and social support and getting through this time. But there are things they just can't talk to friends and family about. So that's number one. It's to have somebody who's who's acutely aware of what this is about, what this means, who understands the terminology, what is an IVF, what is an IUI, what is azospermia, um, where they can... Terminology. Yes, yeah, so we understand the terminology. We also understand the processes. We can also communicate with the doctors. We also, we're just an objective outside person. And then we have a lot of tools of the trade like EMDR and cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that. And so you are working directly with fertility clinics. So 
how might somebody um, access support? So there's um, most of the clinics that I, I work with four different clinics here in Atlanta. Um, I'm external and most of the clinics here um, and uh, have a list of people who are skilled in this. So that's one way they will give patients, they say, these are the counselors that we know that are, are experienced and well-trained in, in treating fertility patients. We also, there are some clinics that luckily have a mental health professional embedded in the clinic so they can be there on site, which is great. There's also the mental health professional group has a directory um, that uh, is easily accessed by patients. So you can actually go into the directory and see people um, who's in your state, who's in your area. Um, there's also, there are also other resources, uh, online searches. There are um, apps that, tr that uh, people pay to be, to advertise their services. So there's all, lots of different ways. From the perspective of a fertility clinic, um, why might it be a good idea for them to offer this kind of support to their patients? Can it actually help with outcomes? Can it help with other things for the clinic? Well, number one, patients are suffering. This is, like I said, a very emotionally difficult, emotionally fraught process, and their patients are suffering, really. And so to just to alleviate suffering, it helps to talk to somebody to access mental health care. That's, that's I think, for, first and foremost. Um, and when a patient is agitated, anxious, depressed, um, stressed, right right how are they going to be they're probably going to call more call the clinic more often need more time they may lose their temper they may um, have emotional outbursts which is natural and valid but it's also i think harder for the staff mm -hmm. so there is a staff burnout from patients that are suffering maybe you've seen it as well some um, some kind of statistics around even dropout rates of treatment, yeah. which is, you know, obviously a bad thing for patients who are not able to continue with their treatment, but also a bad thing for clinics. You're absolutely right, Catherine, that there have been some studies now looking at patient dropout rates uh, and comparing those with mental health issues. So if the more, the more, more people that drop out are, are, pinpointing mental health issues, stress, how emotionally difficult this was, how much pressure this push put on the couple, the couple's relationship, and that leads to higher dropout rates. So patients end up coming, spending all this money here, um, going through all that emotional roller coaster, and then it's just too much for them and they drop out. Whereas if they had, if they were working with a mental health professional, that would give them some, may, may give them the support they need. There is also some, there, we're, we're always trying to dig into this. There is some research suggesting that there are higher pregnancy rates in patients that have the mental health support that they need. But I, I, I would not say that equivoc uh, unequivocally, um, but, um, but we're, we keep digging into that. We keep trying to research that. That's kind of one of those really interesting areas that's still being studied, isn't it, around even looking at when people are stressed, they're more likely to make unhealthy lifestyle choices, for instance. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, yes. So it's not, a, it's not a magic kind of hocus pocus that my stress hormones are going to keep me from getting pregnant. It may be that you're smoking more or drinking more or eating more or doing things that are unhealthy. You referenced this a little bit earlier about um, telehealth. So since the pandemic, has that slightly changed um, how people might engage or even prefer to engage with mental and emotional health services? You know, I did a talk on this earlier today for my professional <laughs> association. So, so it's all fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, it's, we are all doing almost exclusive telehealth and patients are loving it really because, so let's say you're working from home or even working from your office in front of a screen and you need to, you want your mental health appointment. Well, in the old days, 
you would have to make an excuse to your boss. You know, some, some people are very open about it, but some people, they just don't want their boss to know their business and leave and drive in heavy traffic to my office and then have their 45 minute 50 minute appointment and then drive back to the office well that may block out two hours from their day yeah whereas now they close the door if they have a door find a place you know in the building to have a you know quiet and quiet and privacy and they can have their session so it's so much more convenient if they have children at home they can schedule when the baby naps or when the kids are in school you know doing their zoom school um and here there's there's there are a lot of mental health professionals and clinics in atlanta and then three five hours away very few or none so mm -hmm. people don't have to take a day off of work and drive all the way to atlanta to to do their mental health appointments they're much more accessible, much more accessible. Um, you mentioned before the strain um that for fertility treatment can put on a, a couple's relationship as one example, but we're also seeing um, far more individuals undergoing fertility treatments. Um, are there other, some other sort of cases potentially in donor scenarios where people might find that they need some extra help? Uh, well, all, all, um, all people who are using donors are actually asked to come see a mental health professional. Um, because we want them to understand the implications of using somebody else's DNA, somebody from outside of their family to build their family and all the decisions they'll need to make. So, so I do quite a lot of consultations with people using donors. Some of them are a man and wife. Some of them are a couple who are unmarried. Some of them are two gay dads or, or guys that want to be dads and they're married or two, two women who are married who want to be moms. Some of them are single moms by choice or want to be single moms by choice. And every once in a while, I see a man who wants to be a single dad by choice. That's interesting because I'd imagine there's still more stigma around some of those routes to parenthood. And so people may be facing not just those kind of internal um, processes that we were talking about before, but sometimes wider social things to battle through too. Yeah, I see that more in single moms by choice. Um, sometimes they're just heartbroken that they had always planned to find the right guy and they didn't and they come face to face with, well, it's now or never because there is women, um, women lose their fertility at a much younger age than men do. So, so they, there's a lot of, um, they're, they're struggling with the stigma. And um, the men who come to it don't seem to be struggling that much. And usually they're coming a bit younger, although once in a while I see an older man. ASRM is very attentive to the needs of the LGBTQI community. Um, we actually have a special interest group that was started by one of my colleagues and um, just to make sure that there's presentations at our conferences and information that gets out into the, the, um, the world about LGBTQI family building. And the gay dads and the gay moms are just excited. So, you know, it's time to move on. Let's, let's do this. Do you think that currently clinics are offering enough services or enough ways to support patients? Uh, the clinics I work with do, and I do think there's still a lot to be learned about the trans community. Uh, we've heard reports about a lot of insensitivity um, if for family building, people coming in for family building. So, so we have some education to do there. Yeah, I think there's always an opportunity to do better and do more, isn't there? We've, we've heard some interesting things from patients saying that they weren't necessarily signposted to help. They weren't aware that help could be available. I think that's actually really important because I see a lot of people who just were not aware that it was it, it would be good for them to go to the clinic. And so we need to do a much better job with getting the word out that these are the resources, these are the things to look for, et cetera. 
And do you have any advice for kind of self-help or self-care for people who are facing fertility struggles? Self-care is really, really valuable. And I think it's critical actually in this journey. So um, my self-care is gone right now in terms of, I used to go get a foot massage or mani-pedi and I haven't done that in a while. Um, But um, number one, it's really helpful just to set aside time to do something to devote to self-care. Could be something as simple as a bubble bath or just sitting in a, um, in a nice room where you're reading a, a good book. It could be doing yoga at home. Um, but it's also helpful to join uh, resource groups like Resolve um, that are, have, offer support and advocacy for uh, fertility treatment and fertility patients. Um, and anybody who's doing family building, it's also around adoption. Uh, taking vacations from treatment is sometimes a good thing. Sometimes it's the timing isn't right, but if you can take a vacation from treatment when you're going on that emotional roller coaster, sometimes it gives you space to recover. So that's a nice self care. So anything that you can do to set aside learning meditation, mindfulness meditation. Just speaking about meditation, though, we spoke a bit about earlier how grief was a big theme that you encounter. What are some of those other emotions that things like meditation can help with? So meditation really helps us with mind-body focus. So we can really get in touch with our body. We can also learn better how to modulate those emotional states. So sometimes, you know, I I tell my patients that when we're really stressed or anxious, we start to get tunnel vision Mm -hmm. and we don't have access to our full, beautiful brain. So, um, so if we can learn how to meditate or modulate those states, we can have more full access to our brain. We can make better decisions. We can interact better. We can engage better. So meditation is a great option and it does help. So you've obviously spoken to hundreds and hundreds of um, people facing facility struggles um, over the years. Based off that, are there any things that you would say should be avoided um, saying to someone who's going through those problems or actually on the flip side, some things that are good in helping support somebody. You know, I have a handout that I've given to patients who, um, to help them create sensitivity among their support group. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. It's a little bit long, but it does a lot of do's and don'ts don'ts. So this is uh, designed as a letter for people to send or personalize and send to people who um, who are in their support network, who they would like to teach to become more sensitive. So this would be, again, a letter. I want you to know that you're an important person in my life. I want to help you understand what I'm going through. That's why I'm sharing this with you. First of all, I might not be the best friend or daughter or sister or daughter-in-law, et cetera, right now because of the toll infertility tends to take on my emotions. I want you to know that I'm current, I currently live on an emotional roller coaster, which depends on treatment, successes, failures, vacations, etc. On some days, I might be hopeful and optimistic, and on other days, I might be grieving or feeling empty. I may be stressed by financial strain or irritable from medications or scared of pregnancy loss or an upcoming procedure. It will be hard for you to know exactly where I am emotionally at any point in time. I know you want to be there for me and you don't know quite how to approach me. That's why I'm giving you this information on some do's and don'ts of being a supportive person in my life. Do you want me to read you the do's and and don'ts? Yeah. So don't tell me, just relax and you'll get pregnant. Don't tell me that my being pregnant may not be meant to be. And don't tell me that it's God's will. Don't complain or brag about your own pregnancy. Don't often offer advice on procedures or processes unless I inquired. In other words, don't tell me, have you tried IVF? Or maybe it's time to think about adoption. 
don't minimize my problem or compare it to other people's problems. Like, well, think how nice it, it would be to be on a child-free vacation. That's a really insensitive thing to say. Um, don't share my fertility challenges with anyone else and don't avoid me because I'm not in a good place. And please don't be insulted or take it personally if I can't hold your baby or go to your baby shower. So those are some don'ts. Mm. Um, here's, here's some do's. Do try to empathize with how difficult this is for me and say something empathic like, I'm sorry you're going through this. That's awful. I can't imagine how you must feel. Hang in there. I'm here for you. I'm thinking about you. Please let me know if you want to talk, and I'm so frustrated for you. Please listen. Just listen if I ask you for a talk. And if you can, let me cry on your shoulder or sulk. Please distract me. Take me out to a movie in other times, of course, lunch or for a mani-pedi. Please offer to come with me to the doctor. And please email me or my husband discreetly and sensitively in order to break the news of your or a mutual friend's pregnancy. If I'm religious, you can ask if you can pray for me. Please hold up more than your fair share of our relationship right now and understand that I may not be myself right now and it's not a reflection of how I be feel about you. Thank you for being in my life. Whether it shows right now or not, I'm really glad to have you here for me. Here's to hoping that I'm in a better place sometime in the near future. It's really nice that you finish with the do's as well, because I think that even when people are aware of the don'ts, I think that avoiding or that vacuum that you mentioned can come into play where people can get maybe even more isolated. If there's anything final that you would like to say to people um, around getting help if they're if they're struggling at all or if they're experiencing any of the things that we discussed today what would your advice be I would say that they're not alone that there are wonderful resources and um, joining a support group which is now much easier because it's done on telehealth is a wonderful thing um, what I have observed when I've run support groups is that people are looking around and saying, you get me. And that in and of itself is healing. But there are mental health professionals out there who are experienced and trained in this particular arena, and we are there for you. And um, please access us. Dr. Lauren Berman, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing all your wisdom. Thanks again. Thank you. It's been fun. Take care.